If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, this evening, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, this is a passage that is seldom preached on. And understandably so, who really wants to spend a church service talking about lawsuits? And uh, knowing that my aunt and uncle were going to be here from out of town and wanting to show off, I could put it nicer, but you know, I was really, really tempted to go all the way through verse 11 and just kind of skip through the first eight verses. Because verses 9 to 11 will preach. Um, but verses 1 through 8 are also very, very important. Um, God inspired the writing of these words. They are an important part of his counsel for the church. And they do contain rich spiritual truths that should bless and encourage our hearts this evening. And so before we read the text, will you please pray with me? Our Lord, we give thanks to you, for you are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. You have redeemed us from trouble. You have gathered us to yourself from east and west and north and south, from every tongue and tribe and people and nation. You have called us not merely to be refugees in your kingdom, but you have adopted us as sons and daughters and heirs. As we cried to you in our trouble, you have delivered us from our distress, and you lead us along your straight way until we reach the celestial city. How can we cease to praise your wondrous works towards the children of man? You satisfy our souls. You fill us with good things. Lord, we ask that you would satisfy us again. That we would not be tempted like some of these Corinthians were to wrong and defraud others, even their own brothers. Help us to see the riches that we have in your Son. And let us choose rather to suffer wrong. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters across this country and across the world. Those whom we, we know and love who have moved to other places. Those whom we have never met and will never meet until eternity. They are our brothers and our sisters. They are your children. We ask that you would bless them. That you would bless the preaching of your word in every place. That you would get glory from our lives. And that we would find joy and peace and life in your presence. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. 
To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. This is the word of our Lord. And this is also a hard text to march through in a straight line. Paul's making a, a general case about a general situation. He's, he's not referring to a specific instance, although it's, it's very likely that he's writing this because there are multiple instances of these lawsuits happening within the Corinthian church. And he's making his argument through the use of rhetorical questions rather than commands. I, I hope that came across as I was reading it. If you count them, you'll find eight question marks in these eight verses and two exclamation points, and I didn't count the periods, but I think there's only one or two. Um, he's, he's not directing anything. He's asking questions, uh, but he's not asking for information. He's asking the questions to make a point. There, there is a clear, correct answer to the questions that he's asking. He's dealing with a sin problem in the church, and he deals with it in the same way that he's dealing, that he has dealt with the sexual immorality in verse, in chapter 5. Uh, and so, chapter 5 actually has a, a much greater bearing on chapter 6 than we're tempted to think. You hear lots and lots of sermons on 1 Corinthians chapter 5, at least among churches that practice church discipline. Um, but even there, you don't hear very many on 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But, but they are they're right next to each other for a reason. And we're going to deal with the passage in the same general outline that we used for chapter 5 last week. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the sin, we'll look at the situation in the church, and then we'll look at the, the solution. So we will be moving around through these eight verses a little bit. But the sin, the situation, and the solution. So, so first, what exactly is the sin that Paul is addressing in the text? The, the problem is, the sin is, there's these lawsuits. Lawsuits between Christians in Corinth going on. Um, there, there have been very detailed analyses of the legal system in Greece and in the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, Suffice it to say that the legal system in ancient Rome was very similar to the legal system we have today. Not surprisingly, our founding fathers looked to Rome and said, we want a country like, not the Roman Empire, but the Roman Republic. And down, down to the term Senate, um, they took that just straight from Rome. They wanted to be like the Romans. And, and so the legal system worked like this. If you had a complaint against someone else, not a matter of grievous wrongdoing. You haven't murdered someone. Um, you haven't, you know, robbed a caravan. But someone has a complaint against you. You know, this guy's ox gored my donkey. Um, this guy built a new fence, and he built it three feet over the property line. So he's stealing my property. Uh, if you're saying, you know, this guy borrowed my wheelbarrow, and he broke it, and he won't pay me to get a new one. Um, Anything like that, you and your opponent would go before a judge. You would each argue your case, or if you had money or connections, your hired lawyer would argue your case for you. The judge would listen to the arguments, and then the judge would render a verdict. The most famous biblical example of, of such a legal case is actually before the Roman Empire was established during the reign of King Solomon. Um, it's only a very recent development where judges and governors or executives have been separated. Um, we, we read in the Nicene Creed, right? Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Was, was Pontius Pilate the appellate judge for Judea? No, he was the governor of Jerusalem. And he's the one who sat in judgment. And in 1 Kings, King Solomon is sitting in judgment over his people. And there are two women who come to him. These women live together. They have each become pregnant. They deliver children within three days of each other. And one of the children dies. And each woman insists that the living child is my child. And the dead child is her child. 
and there's no DNA evidence in those days. So they come to King Solomon with a seemingly unsolvable debate. And King Solomon demonstrates his wisdom when, when he declares, well, to make this fair, we'll cut the child in half, and each of you can have one half. And one woman says, yeah, that's a great idea. Neither of us will have them. That's fair. But the other woman surrenders her claim on the child, says, no, don't, don't kill him. Just keep him alive. She, she can have him. It's better that I lose my son than, than that he be killed. And Solomon then declares that this woman is clearly the mother of the child. And they give the child to the rightful mother. But that's the way these lawsuits worked. It, it wasn't a criminal trial. It was a civil trial. You have a complaint against somebody else. They've, they've damaged me somehow. They've, they've harmed my property. They've harmed me. And I want to be made whole. I want restitution. As sinners living in the midst of sinners, it's not surprising that we would have disputes and disagreements and complaints against others. We, we do wrong each other. Sometimes accidentally. Sometimes on purpose. And more than occasionally, when we do wrong someone else, we are unwilling to acknowledge our wrongdoing. And, and so we have this legal system that exists to, at least theoretically, pursue justice and right wrongs. And it's, it's a good thing to have a legal system that can address such complaints. So that we don't just live at the mercy of whoever is the biggest and the strongest and the best armed. And yet, Paul is outraged that these Corinthian Christians are making use of the Corinthian legal system. Uh, most English translations move the word to the middle of the verse, but, but that word, uh, dare, does he dare go to law? That's actually the first word of the sentence as Paul writes it. And, and I think it would probably be closer if we translated it. How dare you, when you have a complaint or a grievance against another, how dare you? Go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints. What, what nerve? What gall? It, it's unbelievable. This isn't how things are done. This isn't how things should be done. How dare you? He, he's incredulous that they would do this. This legal system, that's a good thing. But it, it, it's still unbelievable that they would ever go to this legal system. And, and again... In verse 4, it says, so, so if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Why are you going to the law courts? You shouldn't do this. And again, in verses 6 and 7, he says, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. And, and then the clearest statement he makes, without a question, verse 7 to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. The mere fact that you're ending up in a law court means you've already lost. And we'll talk about why this is wrong and sinful in a moment, but, but just, let's be clear. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, a Christian who files a lawsuit against another Christian, is in sin. And the church that allows this to happen is likewise in sin. There's, there's both an individual and a corporate collective responsibility here, just like there was in chapter 5. Christians ought not to go to law against other Christians. Why not? Be, because of the situation of the church. Specifically, we, we can have Three subpoints here if you're the note taking type. Because of the future of the church, because of the nature of the church, and because of the nature of those outside the church. So Paul talks about the future of the church in verses 2 and 3. It says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Verse 3 Do you not know that we are to judge angels? 
How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So the future of the church, and, and, and notice, notice here, right? he says the saints are to judge the world, and then immediately he says, and if the world is to be judged by you. Right? So, so historically, we'll, we'll talk about St. Augustine, St. Paul, St. Thomas Aquinas, but biblically, there's not this special subcategory of saints who are especially holy, who are going to be in some superior position to the regular Christians like us. Um, Paul uses the word saints constantly to refer to the entire church. You've been made holy, sanctified by Jesus Christ. The entire, all, all Christians are saints. And it's all the saints, all the Christians who are going to judge the world and to judge angels. And time and time again throughout the Old Testament, God declares that He is going to judge all the nations of the earth. One of the titles He's given is the judge of all the earth. And then in, in John chapter 5, Jesus says that this judgment has been entrusted to Him by the Father because He is the Son of Man. And, and then furthermore, in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus told His disciples that those who follow him would sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He doesn't say that just about his disciples, the, the 12 that he particularly called. He says, those who follow me will sit on these thrones. And in Revelation uh, chapter 20, verse 4, in, in a passage we refer to fairly frequently, we talk about the judgment seat of Christ, but in verse 4, John doesn't say that he just saw a throne, but he sees thrones. And on those thrones, those to whom judgment, or those to whom the authority to judge has been committed. And, and so, we see that just as Christians share in the reign of Jesus Christ, so we also will share in his judgment over both the physical world and the spiritual world. How exactly we exercise that judgment is not spelled out in Scripture. How exactly Jesus is going to exercise His reign in eternity is not clearly spelled out in Scripture. But we do see a hint of it in Revelation 20, verse 12, where we're told that books were opened and the dead were judged according to what was written in the books, according to what they had done. We can be confident that the judgment, this last great judgment, will be carried out according to God's perfect wisdom and justice. The judge of all the earth will do right. And his people will be privileged to share in that judgment. But it, it's not Paul's concern at this moment to explain to the Corinthians about how they're going to judge the earth, or how they're going to judge angels. His concern is to remind them, guys, you're going to do these things. And if you're going to be entrusted to judge all the earth, and entrusted to judge angels, can't you judge these trivial matters between you as well? Can't you judge matters pertaining to this life, if you're going to sit in judgment over fallen angels? And compared to this, this last judgment, every earthly case is trivial. I, for the first time in my life this afternoon, I looked up some of the statutes for Illinois Small Claims Court. I've never had an occasion uh, to be in Small Claims Court. I hope I never do have an occasion to be in Small Claims Court. But uh, a small claim, the state of Illinois at least, is anything up to $10,000 can be settled in small claims court. $10,000 sounds like a whole lot of money to me. Yeah. Uh, but, but then you consider that between, um, you probably haven't been following this closely being from New Hampshire, but you know our football team abandoned St. Louis a few years ago. Uh, they moved back to Los Angeles where we had rightfully stolen them from 20 years <laughs> earlier. And St. Louis is kind of upset about it. There's a lawsuit going on between the city of St. Louis and the National Football League 
uh, it's specifically Stan Kroenke, but the entire league as well. Uh, and, and this lawsuit is for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and so far in the pretrial, St. Louis seems to be winning. Um, four of the owners of the NFL have already been fined by the judge and are threatened to be held in contempt of court. So that, that, that's not a small claim. I mean, that's hundreds of millions of dollars, far more money than I'm ever going to make in my life, probably more money than all of us collectively are going to make in our lives. But still, even that case is trivial compared to the final judgment. Any earthly case, the greatest, the largest of earthly cases, will, will deal with the disposition of earthly wealth to be used and enjoyed for a few decades of life. But the disposition of souls is for eternity. The saints are to judge the earth and, and even angels. And from that judgment, some will enter into eternal life and some will enter into eternal death. And the church, through Christ, is made competent for that judgment. And the church is competent to judge disputes in this life as well. So the future of the church indicates that the church should be able to judge disputes between brothers. And at the same time, not, not only the future of the church, but the nature of the church qualifies it to, to carry out these judgments when it's necessary. In, in verse 5, Paul asks another rhetorical question. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between brothers? Now Paul spent the first two chapters of this letter discussing wisdom. Some among the, the Corinthians were very proud of the human wisdom that they possessed, of their familiarity with Socrates and Plato and, and Aristotle and Demosthenes and lots of other Greek philosophers that I've never learned about. That's okay. They knew how to argue. They, they knew how to reason. They knew how to make arguments. They were probably very good lawyers. But Paul insists that there's a greater spiritual wisdom that every Christian possesses by virtue of the Holy Spirit. The second chapter of 1 Corinthians ends with a statement, we have the mind of Christ. But the first chapter uh, draws to a conclusion by saying, because of Him we are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We have this wisdom, this spiritual wisdom that might not seem impressive in the world's eyes, but it is the wisdom from God. It's the wisdom of the one who created and upholds and sustains reality. Or, as, as Ezekiel 36 puts it, perhaps a little more straightforwardly, God has put his law upon our hearts. And he causes us to walk in his statutes and to obey his rules. And so, if we do have the mind of Christ, if we have the Holy Spirit, if we have God's law upon our hearts, then, then as a church, Christian, we, we know right from wrong. Far better than the world does. And we can determine what's right and what's wrong when, when two brothers are in a dispute. Maybe, maybe not the, the precise limits of what our ever more complicated legal system says someone is entitled to or, or permitted to do. But what is really right? Are there, there are some states that, and, and this, is, this is unbelievable to me, but if, if you have a home, that's sitting empty, you know, maybe, maybe you own property in two states, you know, you, you live in Florida over the winter, and you live in New England over the summer, and if, if someone breaks into your home in 
Florida while you're not there for six months, and they're a squatter there for however a certain length of time, then in some states they become the legal resident of that home. And it, you can't evict them just because they've been there for so long. And so the law might allow that, but it's not right. right? The, the law might allow you in certain circumstances to default on your debts. Um, right? it, it might be legal, but if, if you've taken out a loan, you are obligated to pay it back as quickly as you're able to. Right? And I mean, we should be gracious about the time span for repaying it, but we should, no, the right thing to do, even if it's legally forgiven, is to pay back your debt. Right? So, so there is a difference between what's legal and what's right. I'm, I'm not saying that the church possesses the perfect wisdom to know every detail of the U.S. legal code. But we have the wisdom to know what's right and what someone should do. And we also not only have this wisdom, but, but we as a church have the authority and the obligation to settle these disputes. No, notice again the language that Paul uses in verse 5. He says, can it be that no one among you has the wisdom to settle a dispute between brothers? Between the brothers, not not between neighbors, not between acquaintances or friends, certainly not between enemies, between brothers. Every Christian has been adopted by God the Father, made a co-heir with Jesus Christ. And so brother or sister isn't just a title that, that's given to some Christians called to some particular role. They're, they're the monks in the monastery, they're the brothers. Um, it's the spiritual reality of the Christian life. In, in Mark 3.35, as Jesus is teaching a crowd, his, his mother and his brothers come looking for him. They're, they're worried about Jesus. I mean, they, they knew he was always a little different, but now... They're worried. And they're looking for him. They're standing outside the crowd. And, and, and is Jesus in there? And the word gets passed to the front. And, and hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. They're looking for you. And Jesus looks around at those sitting around and listening to him. And he says, These are my mother and my brothers. He says, For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, obviously, this is a very large family. And we don't know all of our spiritual siblings yet. We're closer to some of them than we are to others. But we're still a family. And, and thus, every dispute between Christians is a familial dispute. And, and I know those can get very ugly. I, I've heard a whole lot of stories about siblings ending up hating each other after arguing about the inheritance they receive from their parents. And it, it's, it's awful that families get separated over something like that. And that's a large part of why, verse 7, having a lawsuit at all between one another is already a defeat. Because we are a family. And so it, it's absolutely essential that the church resolves any disputes within the family so that the family can be united and reconciled and continue to live together in the bond of peace. Because we are a family, we, we have an obligation to love one another that goes beyond our desire for the greatest possible financial gain in these disputes. And so by the grace of God and, and with the wisdom of God, we can settle our family quarrels. And then also the nature of those outside the church makes it necessary for the church to resolve its own disputes. Uh, Paul describes these 
secular law courts in, in three verses, uh, verses 1, 4, and 6. In verse 1, he describes them as the unrighteous. In verse 4, he says they're those with no standing in the church. And then in verse 6, he calls them unbelievers. Those outside of the church do not have the Holy Spirit. They, they do not have the mind of Christ. They do not have the wisdom from God. And, and so they cannot consistently and accurately determine right and wrong. We, we see that so much in our political discourse today. Where we, we don't just have competing visions on, well, what's the best means to achieve good? But, but we disagree entirely upon what is good. What goals should we be striving towards? Not, not just the means to get there, but the very nature of what is good. Now, this, this doesn't mean that secular judges are always going to reach a wrong decision. But it, it does mean that we cannot expect them to always reach the right decision. They're, they're already, in rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ, rejecting the first great commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. And it's only on the basis of the first commandment that you can carry out the second commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. That they might still be good men as the world judges men, but they're still unrighteous. They, they don't know God's righteousness. And they're seeking to establish their own. They're unbelievers. They, they don't understand the driving motivations of the Christian life. And they have no standing in the church. They're going to be judged on the last day. They're, they're not going to stand in the judgment with Christ and His elect. And so they shouldn't be judging the church now. And we shouldn't be going to them for judgment. So not only do the secular judges not have the necessary competence to judge a dispute between Christians, but, but going to them for judgment wrongs them as well. Because when we, as Christians, bring lawsuits against one another, we're lying about the gospel. We're cheapening it in the eyes of everyone who sees us. And, and even if it's a completely sealed case that no one ever hears of outside of the courtroom, it's still going to be seen by this judge making his verdict. When, when we as Christians bring lawsuits against one another, we communicate to the world that, that we're just like them. We're, we're greedy for gain however we can get it. We're determined that whatever happens, I'm going to get mine. And we, we, show, we show that we're more concerned with winning than we are with what is true and what is right. And so many court cases have been won and lost, not on the merits of the facts, but just on who can hire the best lawyer. But when we resolve our disagreements without bringing it before the law, we, we show the power of the gospel in our lives how it unites us one to another, how it regenerates our hearts, how it restores our consciences, so that we can live peacefully and joyfully together without resorting to the power of the law and the power of the state. So the sin is, is filing lawsuits, going to law against fellow believers. So the situation is that the church is competent to judge those disputes and obligated to judge those disputes, while the world is both incompetent to judge those disputes and harmed or misled about the truth of the gospel when it is asked to judge those disputes. So what's, what's the solution? They, you know, Paul never comes right out and says it. He doesn't say, okay, so this is exactly what you should do. He did that in chapter 5. Uh, he doesn't do it here. But it's very clear behind every question that he asks. Grievances between Christians should be settled within the church, not before the law. This is what Jesus taught in Matthew 18, and it's what Paul just walked through in, in 1 Corinthians 5. If you have a complaint against a brother, whether, whether he broke something of yours 
or sinned against you somehow, he, he slandered you, he built his fence on your side of the property line, whatever else, the first step is to go and talk to your brother privately between you and him alone. And if he listens, you've won your brother. And the vast majority of disputes within the church are going to get resolved right at this step. Say, hey, brother, you, you borrowed my hammer and you brought it back and the head fell off. I think you were swinging it too hard. And, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, let me either fix it or let me get you a new hammer. Um, hey, you're building this fence and it looks great, but you're actually, you know, four feet onto, onto my property. But, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. I'll move it back to where the property line is. Um, whatever it is. But if he refuses to listen to you, then in what Jesus taught in, in Matthew 18 is... And the next step is to bring one or two others with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of, of two or three witnesses. So, so you bring several people who agree and, and say, Brother, you, you were wrong here. Whatever you, you did, you, you wronged your brother. And, and this is what you need to do to make it right. And if he refuses to listen to them, then you bring it to the whole church. And the church as a whole makes a judgment about the issue. And they tell whichever brother's in the wrong, maybe they tell both, maybe both of them are in the wrong. And say, well, you both need to do this to be reconciled. But what if they, they, they tell, okay, this guys, this is what you need to do. If your ox gored this guy's ox, then you, know, you slaughter that ox and you sell that ox and you split the money and you split the meat. Um, whatever it is that they need to do. They tell them what to do. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, then the church is supposed to treat them as a tax collector and a Gentile. They're, they're to be put out of the church because they're refusing to be reconciled, because they're refusing to pursue righteousness. that the church led by the elders acts as the judge makes, makes the judgment. And it's, it's really sobering to note in the history of the church that at the same time as churches abandoned the practice of discipline is the same time when lawsuits between brothers in Christ started happening more and more because the church is not resolving these problems anymore. It just tries to stay out of it. And so people are, are almost forced to turn to the law. But what should you do if you disagree with the judgment of the church? The guy builds his fence and, and you say, hey, no, that's, that's on my side of the property line. And the guy says, no, I'm pretty sure this is the property line and you can't find a clear answer in your property deeds, and the church says, well, we don't, we don't know where the property line is, and this seems like a fair place for it. So we're just going to let the fence stay there. And you're absolutely certain. No, that's, that's your property. What should you do? Verse 7 says, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Even, even the best and wisest of churches are not all-knowing, and they're not perfect. Maybe they've made an error in their judgment. Or, or maybe you've just been too influenced by your own self-interest to be a neutral, uh, neutral judge. Maybe the damage you feel you suffered is far in ex excess of the damage you actually suffered. Either way, it's not time to take the nuclear option. Okay, well, I tried it with the church, and they didn't give me the answer I liked, so now I'm going to the law court. Rather, Paul tells us we should prefer to suffer the wrong. Why? 
because there's more important things in life than winning, even than winning considerable amounts of money. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 commands us to strive for peace with everyone. We should especially strive for peace within the church. We should value peace and harmony and, and unity within our spiritual family above whatever financial gain we, we might have if we win our dispute. And connected to that command to strive for peace is, is the command to strive for holiness, for devotion to the Lord. And, and if we are in love with money and earthly goods, then we're devoted to something other than God, and, and we're setting our eyes and our hearts on something that is doomed to pass away. Our priority ought always to be on the eternal. And, and what we have gained from the grace of God is so much greater than all that we could lose at the hands of the world, that no matter how severely the world might defraud us. Ephesians 2 tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were by nature children of wrath, destined for eternal destruction at the judgment of God because we constantly transgressed His laws and we did not give Him glory. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all thrones and authorities and dominions and rulers. Jesus Christ took our sins upon Himself when He was crucified. He suffered the penalty for those sins, and He died under the wrath that our sins deserved. But as the penalty was, was completed, on the third day He rose from the dead, swallowing up sin and death forever, and sharing His righteousness with all those who would repent of their sins and trust in His promises so that they might be received as friends and, and even as sons of God, sharing in His glory and authority and riches of Christ. That the greatest debt, the severest penalty in all the world, taken away by the graciousness of another, and the greatest reward in all the world given to you by that same hand. Being an, an impoverished orphan in the slums of the third world, and, and being plucked out of that situation, and made an heir of the richest man in all the world, doesn't compare to the magnitude of what you have gained through the gospel of Jesus Christ, of what you can gain through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and being the recipient of such grace, how can we refuse to be gracious to others? Having been forgiven so much, how can we not forgive the little when we are wronged. Jesus told a, a parable about a man who owed a huge debt. Thousands of years of labor's worth of debt. And his master came to him and said, it's time to pay what you owe me. And, and the man said, please be patient with me and I'll, I'll repay it. He, he was never going to repay this debt. And the master said, I, I forgive you the debt. It was my money to begin with. You're forgiven. And then immediately that servant goes and seizes another servant. And this servant owed him a hundred denarii. That's about three months' wages. It's still a big debt. But it's a very manageable debt. And he immediately begins to beat his fellow servant and, and says, pay me what you owe me. And the man says the exact same thing that, that the other guy said. Just be patient with me, I promise I'll pay it all back. The guy says no, and he throws him in prison until the debt's repaid. How he's supposed to repay the debt when he's in prison, I don't know. But he's angry and he has the authority to do that, and he does. And what does the master do as soon as he hears of it? He, he takes and seizes that servant whose debt he had forgiven. He says, I've, I've forgiven you so much. How could you not also be gracious with this man who owed you so little? And he throws him in prison. 
We've been forgiven so much. Why not rather suffer wrong in this life? If, if the church can't reach the right judgment, bear the wrong graciously, knowing that you have received far more than you might lose. And knowing that at the last judgment, all things will be made right. Those who do deliberately wrong and defraud others, even if they get away with it through the entirety of this life, they will be dealt with in, in the end. Have you been wronged by a brother or sister in Christ? Take it to the church, not to the law. Have you wronged or defrauded someone else? And even if it seems like you've gotten away with it, you need to repent now and go and be reconciled as soon as you possibly can. Time will not heal that wrong. But if you've been wronged or defrauded by someone else beyond the ability of the church to, to rectify them, suffer the wrong, and rejoice to know that you've been enriched by Jesus Christ. And if you don't know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, then repent of your sins and trust in His promises. He is ready and willing to save you. And I promise that you will find in Him a far greater, far more gracious Master than you could ever imagine. And I promise you that His rewards are, are far better than everything in this world. He's given us the church. He's given us His Word. And he's given us Himself. For His sake, we can suffer wrong. For the sake of His name. We pray with you. Our Father, whenever we do suffer wrong, Make our hearts cling more fiercely to your love. Let us willingly accept sorrows and temptations. And let those temptations be the means by which we feel sin to be the greatest evil. And as we're delivered from those sorrows and temptations, may we be filled with gratitude to you. When your Son came into our hearts, he became more dear to us than sin had ever been. His gracious rule replaced sin's tyranny. Your grace is greater than all our sins. Your riches are greater than all the world. And there is nothing that we desire that compares with you. And so we ask, like Moses, that you would show us your glory. Like David, we sing that we seek your face. With Paul, we say that our desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Let us not go to the law for satisfaction. Let us always be satisfied in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.